thank you all for joining another Eagle Haven podcast. Today, we are bringing you another deep dive into the wonders of nature with a fascinating conversation between two scientists. Dr. Julie Boyle is a British veterinarian whom you have heard on other podcasts about hawks and beekeeping. She is also a British military spouse and a mom of five fabulous children ages 9 to 18. Dr. Janet Mann is a professor of psychology and biology at Georgetown University, who has devoted decades of research on dolphins. Her work takes her to dolphin habitats worldwide, and her research has been featured in a range of scientific journals, including the Journal of the Association for Psychological Science. During this conversation today, you will learn about dolphins living and thriving in the Potomac River and what they can teach us about community formations among other psychosocial science. You will also hear what they have in common with dolphin societies around the world. Eagle Haven is lucky and grateful to bring you, dear listeners, these two great scientists and their exploration of Dr. Mann's vast body of work. Listen carefully and you will discover remarkable details about the magical members of a specific dolphin family that lives near one Australian coast with individual names, as well as the hundreds of dolphins thriving and populating the water nearest our nation's capital. And for those of you interested in learning more about local or faraway dolphin families, tune in to the Eagle Haven Learning Center that you will soon find located on our website. There you will discover much more about Dr. Mann's work, a link to several of her publications, and a link to a nonprofit organization that supports Dr. Mann's research and pedagogy. And without further ado, here are Dr. Julie and Dr. Mann. Welcome, Professor Mann. Thank you. It's great to be here. My understanding is that dolphins are types of whales, which Mm -hmm. blew my mind when I found that out. And whales split into two groups, which are the toothed and the non-toothed. There's toothed whales and baleen whales. And they're very, very different. They have very different strategies. And, you know, the baleen whales have evolved like huge body size, the biggest animal that ever lived Mm -hmm. and lives today, which Mm -hmm. is the blue whale. Mm -hmm. And they migrate, you know, have kind of these breeding feeding cycles. The toothed whales, um, although some of them do migrate uh, a little bit, they tend to have bigger brains and smaller bodies okay. and teeth. But all of them are mammals, aren't they? Which, again, fascinates me, sort of, that they give birth in water and the babies are born in water, but they still need to breathe. And I believe you've observed births of dolphins. Can you maybe run through that a little bit with us? Sure. So my students did observe a birth in the Potomac which was really exciting. And I've observed a number of calves that, have just, that are just hours old, so pretty soon after the birth. Because usually, I think in Shark Bay anyway, where I work in Australia, they give birth in the wee hours of the morning. Mm-hmm. But it's fascinating because breathing is conscious in dolphins, so the very young calf has to learn how to breathe is the first thing and stay with its mother. You can actually watch them thinking about it almost because when they're very young they kind of bob up to the surface and it's like I'm here for a reason I'm here (laughs) for a reason and then suddenly they go and there's a little breath and then they go down you know so it's um fun to watch them learn so you mentioned two places there Shark Bay which is in Australia and that was your first introduction to dolphins Mm -hmm. and what sort of research have you been doing in Shark Bay in Australia so in Shark Bay, it's a you know wonderful place, very remote. It's in Western Australia. It's north of Perth, which is the most remote city in the world. And then you have to drive nine hours north <laughs> to get to the field site. Um, it's also a World Heritage Area, but the water is shallow and clear, and we can see what the animals are doing. And the dolphins are residential, so they live there year-round. So we can observe them year-round. They're not moving anywhere, and they also have kind of individual home ranges. So you can go out and find specific individuals in a given day. And subsequent to that, you have found that you have dolphins much closer to home. uh, And I believe we have dolphins very close here in the Potomac. Yes. So I've been studying the dolphins in Shark Bay for over 30 years. 
and I'm a bit of a workaholic, and my husband was trying to get me away from my work. And he started looking at little cottages down in the northern neck of Virginia, and I didn't even want to do this, but eventually we found a cottage that we both liked on the lower Potomac, and we bought it, and on the day we closed, I walked into the backyard and said, oh, look, dolphins. (laughs) And was that your first knowledge of there being dolphins in the Potomac? Yes. I mean, I knew that there were records in the 1800s of dolphins being, you know, near Alexandria. There are a couple of records of that in the 1840s and the 1880s. And then there's records of dolphins going as far up as Georgetown in D.C., also in the 1880s. And there was a scientist at the Smithsonian who said that dolphins were regularly observed you know, upriver around where Quantico is today or and also Indian Head, Maryland on the other side. So uh, dolphins were regularly coming a good ways up the Potomac River. So I knew that, mm-hmm. but I thought that was, you know, 150 years ago and it's not today. Um, do we think they disappeared for maybe 60, 70 years? They didn't come in, come into the Potomac for a long period of time? Or what, what do we well, think? Well, this is something we're still trying to figure out. I have a graduate student who's at Duke University. She worked with me as an undergrad and also in Shark Bay, but she now is working with me on the Potomac Dolphins. And she's been interviewing watermen. And many of the watermen that live on the Potomac have been there for generations. So she's getting a lot of information. So the, I think the dolphins have always been here. It just might have varied. And we're also looking at newspaper archives and lots of other records to see whether it's been reported. I mean, of course, the Potomac had become incredibly polluted. And so President Johnson famously said it was a national disgrace. And it's cleaner now. So, I mean, there are a lot of questions that we have about what influenced the dolphins' use of the Potomac River. And how many dolphins do we think now that are visiting uh, the Potomac? Well, the first year we started the study in 2015, and we identified 200 the first year, 300 the second year, 500 the third year, 800 the fourth year, 1,000 the fifth year, (laughs) and it goes on. Now we have over 2,000 individuals that we have cited. Many of them are repeat visitors. There's like five, 600 that we see uh, regularly, um, and some we've only seen once. And I believe you identify them by their dorsal fin, so the fin that's on their back. So they're all unique, these dorsal fins? The dorsal fins are all unique, as long as you have a good enough photograph. Um, So when they're young, their fins tend to be very clean, but the shape is distinctive. They also have distinctive um, pigment patterns on their side. So if we have a good enough photo, we can match it up. If the photo is not good of the dorsal fin, then it's difficult. But um, yeah, there it, 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 it's it's like a tag. It's um, a natural tag, and you know they become like human faces to me after so many years. Like that's just who they are. Just like when you look at a person, you don't think about all their features. You just know who they are. If you ha- spend a lot of time watching dolphins, that's what happens there too. Well, I mean, 2,000 is such a huge number, and we think that is obviously partly to do with cleaning uh, the Potomac up. So as residents of this sort of area, what can we do to help, you know, clean the Potomac? Is there anything that we can do as members of the public? There are a lot of things that the public can do. There's lots of problems that still exist in the Potomac River. Sewage runoff is still a major issue and other types of runoff from farms, you know, reducing fertilizer, having lots of trees planted along the Potomac to, you know, protect the the shorelines, especially when there's heavy rains, which we're getting more of, we're getting Mm. uh, bigger storms um, and flooding and too much fresh water is also not that good because it reduces the salinity and it can cause bacteria. So that's a big thing. Of course, plastics and microplastics or even the nanoplastics are a huge problem because everything goes up the food chain. And also chemical pollution. You should not be flushing your drugs down the toilet because that goes in there. And even there's concern about, you know, we actually pass drugs that we're taking into the water system and that ends up in the Potomac. So there are many things that we can do to protect the health of the water, and that would make also 
it's better for the fish. It's better for all the wildlife. It's better for the, the birds that eat the fish as well. And certainly for the dolphins. And I believe when you first started doing it, looking, observing uh, dolphins in the Potomac, you did give them names. Now there's 2,000. Do they all have names or? Well, in the Potomac, we have so many animals that now we're naming the ones that we see at least more than once. So the ones we see commonly. And we decide because of the Potomac that we'd name them after famous leaders, political, environmental, social leaders. So we started initially with founding fathers and presidents and vice presidents and first ladies because there are very few women who have been in politics historically. We also we went with also suffragists and abolitionists. We also went to Congress. We try to name them according to the sex of the dolphin. So if she has a calf, we know it's a female and we'll find a female name for her. But sometimes we end up naming them after the opposite sex just happens. So do you have a Kamala Harris? Yes, we do have a Kamala Harris. How about a Clinton, a Hillary Clinton? Yes, Hillary Clinton. We don't see Hillary as much as we see Bill Clinton. Oh, Bill's around a lot. Yeah. yeah. He <laughs> he likes to bow ride. Uh, so he often shows up at the boat. Like whenever it's like, oh, there, yeah, there's Bill Clinton again. So if we wanted to see these dolphins, you say that historically they came up as far as Alexandria. But how far up at the Potomac are they coming currently? We know that they're going past the 301 bridge, which is about halfway up the tidal Potomac. So the Potomac's like over 400 miles, but only, you know, half of that is really tidal waters. So they are kind of regularly going up there. It's not like the further you go towards the mouth, the more likely you are to see them. So when they're not in the Potomac, where are these? I mean, what, what type of year it would be the best if I wanted to go and see them in the Potomac and go up to the bridge? What sort of time of year is a good time to see them? Well, they're coming into the Potomac between April and October. And so they're there in bigger numbers in July and August. But the Potomac hits the Chesapeake Bay proper, you know, about midway up the Chesapeake. So there are dolphins, you know, in the Chesapeake Bay, and they do go, even the dolphins that we see in the Potomac go sometimes all the way as far up as Baltimore. So it's um, not very predictable. I mean, we spend all day looking for dolphins and sometimes we can be on the water for eight hours, you know, in the hot sun looking and, and we'll just see one small group. And other days we see 200 animals. It just, and some days we don't see any. So it's not very predictable. These animals do move around a lot, but some seem to prefer like the lower Potomac and, and that we'll see frequently. And these are all common bottlenose dolphins that you see in the Potomac. Yes, they're all common bottlenose dolphins. There's some debate now if there's different species that's actually kind of the offshore as opposed to the ones that are closer to the coast. But uh, yes, they're all common bottlenose. And that's the dolphin, I think, that we all associate when we think of a picture of a dolphin. It's the, it's the ones that are in, I don't know, SeaWorld and those sort of places. That's your common Correct. bottlenose dolphin. Correct, correct. Now, you said 2,000. So are they all in pods? Is that how it works? Do they always keep in their same pod? What is their sort of interactivity? People call it a pod, but we actually don't use that term. We sort of say group because it's much more flexible than that. They're a bit like people in that they have what's called a society that's characterized by fission fusion, meaning that they join and leave. Like we joined up today for this interview but we'll never be alone together probably for the rest of our lives. And that's a normal thing in humans. When you think about it, it's really bizarre yeah. because we are constantly changing our group membership. But within that, we have close friends and associates and family that we see much more often than other individuals. And dolphins are the same way. They just join and leave throughout the day. And how many do you think they can recognize? Like one dolphin, how many other dolphins do you think that they can recognize? I think they can recognize hundreds. Really? Like people. And there's been one study that has looked at uh, whether dolphins could recognize, even if they hadn't seen each other for 20 years. And, and he got a very strong result using their signature whistles, because dolphins have uh, individually distinctive whistles that functions like a name. So he was able to test their memory of signature whistles for dolphins that they, these were captive dolphins, but they get moved around to different facilities. So he was able to test 
um, whether they remembered that individual and had a they had a very strong reaction to it. And you may think, oh, well, that may, may not be such a big deal, but nobody has actually ever tested that for humans because we have photos. And so we're always clearly reminding each other of, you know, what individuals look like. But yeah, they, they remember for a very long time. I mean, it is difficult enough for a human to recognize someone they haven't seen for 20 years. So that's truly amazing. But they do have big brains, don't they, dolphins? So do we think that's partly because of this social structure that they have? Or what else do we think their brains are so big for? All right. So there's two sort of big theories about brain evolution. One is that brains evolved to solve ecological problems, and the other is that they evolved to solve social problems. But they're not really mutually exclusive. And with the dolphins, we think it's both. They have very complex social lives, but they also have very complex ecological lives. I mean, they're hunting a diversity of prey that, that are very mobile, and they also have exquisite hunting capabilities and echolocation and their auditory cortex is huge. Um, their brain is constructed very differently from our own. But they have lots of social problems to solve as well, just like humans do. So they might have, I don't know, arguments with each other or, you know, they get don't get on with one dolphin, whereas they do with the other dolphin. I mean, is it very similar yeah. to humans like that? Yeah. So what we think is that dolphins can recognize not just the relationships they have with individuals, but the relationships between other individuals, because that's important to know. You know, just like if you badmouth someone who is actually a friend of that individual, you, that would get you into social trouble. So... Yeah, dolphins clearly recognize the relationships between others in addition to themselves. So that's where it gets exponentially more complicated. You have to know a lot more. And you have to use, back to the vision fusion, if animals are joining and leaving, you don't see everything that's going on. There's a lot that's sort of happening, in a sense, off camera. And so with humans, you have to infer based on when you see an individual again, if they're, if they're not being as friendly to you, you might infer, oh, they've probably been talking to so-and-so um, about something I did or whatever it is. And, and dolphins, in, in a sense, seem to have that capability as well. Amazing. I'm not saying they gossip, but <laughs> I don't know. I, I think they probably do <laughs> somehow. <laughs> and, and how do they communicate with each other? I know they have the signature sort of sat name, mm -hmm. uh, but how else can they communicate with each other? They have a range of sounds and very little is known about it, in fact, because the signature whistles have been studied extensively in captivity, but also in the wild because it's a distinctive call and sort of you know what it is and you know who's making the call. The problem is, you know, dolphins have no moving mouth parts. They actually have nasalizations. They have elaborate sacs in their, in their blowholes and they use it like we use our vocal cords and it, they can... It's recycle the air and push a range of sounds, but it comes through the forehead, essentially. They have a fatty melon. They concentrate the sound. So it's very complicated, plus the, the range of the sounds. But because they have no moving mouth parts, you can't tell who's talking if there's uh, or, make, or, or vocalizing. So even if you could actually see the dolphins in real time, you don't know who is making the call. And you could put a hydrophone in the water, but sound travels so fast underwater that you can't still localize who is making the call. And if you don't know who's making the call, you can't, you have to know who mm -hmm. in order to uncover what is going on. So I can give you like a funny example. Just one time I was, I was in, um, this was in Shark Bay and there were these two old females that they've known each other for decades and they're just hanging out by themselves they didn't, either of them, neither of them had kids. And I just thought they were resting. And I dropped a hydrophone in the water. And they were making all these sounds. Like when one was going, mm, you know, mm, you know, mm, you know, mm, and it's like back and forth like that. And it, seemed, it sounded like a conversation. And even the hydrophones weren't picking up the full range of sounds, but it sounded like they were talking about something. So there's a lot of mysteries out there. <laughs> I'm assuming that maybe some of the noises they make are outside the human range of hearing. 
because obviously we can only hear notes that are so high. Yes, yes. Most of them are, I mean, we have underwater microphones that can pick those up. So we, we can record the full range, um, but yeah, we can't hear it in real time. And you mentioned something called the melon before, which I believe is sort of on their forehead. Mm -hmm. And they use that to echolocate as well, do they? To sort of The melon travel? is just like a fatty organ mm -hmm. and it's very good for conducting sound. They use it to focus their echolocation, um, that, which is like clicks. It sounds like a creaky door or what they call vocal fry for us. And yeah, so they can concentrate the sound through the melon. They squeeze the uh, nasal sacs, sort of like pipes in an organ, and then it gets focused through the into the monkey lips, which is sort of you could think of as like our vocal cords. And then it gets concentrated in the fatty melon where they can make it into a beam if it's like echolocation. They're sending out kind of a, a beam of clicks, sort of you could think of it like a flashlight beam. And when those clicks, those sonar pulses, which are high frequency, but when it hits something, it sends back an echo and the echo goes through the jaw of the dolphin, which is the lower jaw, which is filled with oil. And the vibrations then get processed by the inner ear of the dolphin. So they don't have external ears. It kind of comes through the jaw. And their hearing is exquisite and well beyond what we have. And what about their sight? Because I know like with dogs, they might have a great sense of smell, but their eyesight isn't as good as humans typically. What about the dolphins? Do we think they've got good eyesight? They or? have very good eyesight. It's actually as good as ours. Uh -huh. And they can see above and below water. But they don't have color vision but, you know, they can see quite a range of grays and things. And, you know, there's some debate as to whether they can see some color. But really, they have very good vision. So you were talking about the, the echolocation, which sounds like, for us, it's quite confusing, isn't it? We've got two ears on the side of our head, and that's how we hear. But they've got various organs involved. So if there are um, other sounds in the river or the sea or the ocean, does that distract for the dolphins, the, the echolocation tools that they're trying to use? Yeah, so the water can be very noisy because lots of animals in the water depend on acoustic communication of some sort. And that's because uh, sound is such an effective medium underwater where you can't see very far. So lots of fish, males in particular, do mating calls, you know, croakers and oyster toadfish and, uh, you know, many of the fish in the Potomac River make quite a bit of sound. So the dolphins can use that, it's called eavesdropping, <laughs> to both to find fish to eat, because they like croaker particularly quite a lot. But the croaker are also li listening and can detect echolocation of the dolphins. So even the dolphins are trying to be qu relatively quiet, but when they pick up that dolphins are around, then they go completely silent. So they're all listening for each other. This is a real concern if there's quite a lot of boat noise or um, other activity uh, that is producing loud sounds underwater. And obviously we've mentioned that you've seen up to 2,000 dolphins. So there must be a lot of fish there to sustain 2,000 dolphins. And uh, you say they eat croaker fish. Have that, has that population increased over the, over the years? Well, we haven't looked into that at this point. There are some fishing records mainly for commercial fish. And so the dolphins are not, although they eat some of the commercial fish, they're eating a range of fish. So we can't really answer that question. But we do know, based on our observations, that they spend a lot of time traveling. So I think they're looking for like food patches, you know, basically mm -hmm. um, big patches of fish. So the way they move around and sometimes in the group sizes that they're in suggests that um, they must be looking for basically large schools of fish. And they also use tools, I believe, dolphins. They've been seen using tools. I heard that sometimes they use sponges. Is that correct? Yes. So a big part of my work in Shark Bay um, was the discovery of sponge tool use among wild bottlenose dolphins there. And so they get a basket sponge, which is kind of it's shaped like a little basket, and they put it over their rostrum, which is the beak, and they use that to scour the seafloor and scare up fish, mainly barred sand perch, which are fish that kind of sit on the bottom and 
don't have swim bladders. So they're not using, we think they're not using their echolocation very much, but they use the sponge because these fish are very well camouflaged. And so they're using a tool to exploit a niche that they couldn't otherwise see or hear using regular dolphin abilities. But it's a subset of the population. It's only 4% of the dolphins, and it's mostly female. Are there any other examples of them using tools at all? So the tool use in dolphins depends on how you're defining tools. So if you say it's using kind of the external employment of some object to do something, then there are cases like what it could be like the mud ring feeding, which happens in Florida when they they beat their tails kind of in a circle around a school of fish. And that forms like a mud sort of net around the fish. The fish get nervous when they can't see what's going on. Typically mullet, um, they, they do this. And So the dolphins kind of concentrate the mullet within that little mud circle and eat them. So you could say they're using kind of the mud as a tool. And um, yeah, and even humpback whales use bubbles. They create kind of a net around their prey, and it seems to focus the prey. So you could call that tool use. I think I have just one last question, Mm -hmm. and it's why do we love dolphins so much? You know, people love dolphins. I mean, it's in my top three favorite animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, why do we like them so much? It's an interesting question, like why people love dolphins. I think people recognize that they're intelligent, but they're different from us. So I think when people look at primates, they think they're cute, but they think they're like furry little people and kind of beneath us in some way, you know, in some hierarchy. But here are dolphins with this large brain. Of course, they're beautiful to look at, very sleek and athletic but they clearly have these big brains and are very intelligent, very sociable, and they have done things differently. They've had big brains for millions of years and, you know, haven't destroyed the planet. That's literally what I was going to say, they haven't ruined the planet. So there's this kind of a both otherness about them that I think we admire. Well, what remains to say is thank you so much for giving us your wisdom this afternoon. It's been enthralling to learn about the dolphins. I hope maybe one someday when you get some more new research, maybe we can interview you again. But thank you ever so much, Professor Mann. Thank you. It's been my pleasure.